Section 44 of Grey's Anatomy, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3. By Henry Gray. The Thoracic Duct. The thoracic duct, ductus thoracicus, conveys the greater part of the lymph and chyle into the blood. It is the common trunk of all the lymphatic vessels of the body, excepting those on the right side of the head, neck, and thorax, and right upper extremity, the right lung, right side of the heart, and the convex surface of the liver. In the adult, it varies in length from 38 to 45 centimeters and extends from the second lumbar vertebra to the root of the neck. It begins in the abdomen by a triangular dilatation, the cisterna chyli, which is situated on the front of the body of the second lumbar vertebra to the right side of and behind the aorta, by the side of the right crust of the diaphragm. It enters the thorax through the aortic hiatus of the diaphragm and ascends through the posterior mediastinal cavity between the aorta and the azygous vein. Behind it in this region are the vertebral column, the right intercostal arteries, and the hemiazygous veins, as they cross to open into the azygous vein. In front of it are the diaphragm, esophagus, and pericardium, the last being separated from it by a recess of the right pleural cavity. Opposite the fifth thoracic vertebra, it inclines toward the left side, enters the superior mediastinal cavity, and ascends behind the aortic arch and the thoracic part of the left subclavian artery, and between the left side of the esophagus and the left pleura, to the upper orifice of the thorax. Passing into the neck, it forms an arch which rises about three or four centimeters above the clavicle, and crosses anterior to the subclavian artery, the vertebral artery and vein, and the thyrocervical trunk or its branches. It also passes in front of the phrenic nerve and the medial border of the scalenus anterior, but is separated from these two structures by the prevertebral fascia. In front of it are the left common carotid artery, vagus nerve, and internal jugular vein. It ends by opening into the angle of junction of the left subclavian vein with the left internal jugular vein. The thoracic duct at its commencement is about equal in diameter to a goose quill, but it diminishes considerably in caliber in the middle of the thorax and is again dilated just before its termination. It is generally flexuous and constricted at intervals so as to present a varicose appearance. Not infrequently, it divides in the middle of its course into two vessels of unequal size, which soon reunite, or into several branches, which form a plexiform interlacement. It occasionally divides at its upper part into two branches, right and left, the left ending in the usual manner, while the right opens into the right subclavian vein, in connection with the right lymphatic duct. The thoracic duct has several valves. At its termination, it is provided with a pair, the free borders of which are turned toward the vein, so as to prevent the passage of venous blood into the duct. The cisterna chyli, receptaculum chyli, receives the two lumbar lymphatic trunks, right and left, and the intestinal lymphatic trunk. The lumbar trunks are formed by the union of the efferent vessels from the lateral aortic lymph glands. They receive the lymph from the lower limbs, from the walls and viscera of the pelvis, from the kidneys and suprarenal glands, and the deep lymphatics of the greater part of the abdominal wall. The intestinal trunk receives the lymph from the stomach and intestine, from the pancreas and spleen, and from the lower and front part of the liver. Tributaries Opening into the commencement of the thoracic duct on either side is a descending trunk from the posterior intercostal lymph glands 
of the lower six or seven intercostal spaces. In the thorax, the duct is joined, on either side, by a trunk which drains the upper lumbar lymph glands and pierces the crust of the diaphragm. It also receives the efferents from the posterior mediastinal lymph glands and from the posterior intercostal lymph glands of the upper six left spaces. In the neck, it is joined by the left jugular and left subclavian trunks, and sometimes by the left bronchomediastinal trunk. The last named, however, usually opens independently into the junction of the left subclavian and internal jugular veins. The right lymphatic duct, ductus lymphaticus dexter, about 1.25 cm in length, courses along the medial border of the scalenus anterior at the root of the neck and ends in the right subclavian vein, at its angle of junction with the right internal jugular vein. Its orifice is guarded by two semilunar valves, which prevents the passage of venous blood into the duct. Tributaries The right lymphatic duct receives the lymph from the right side of the head and neck through the right jugular trunk. From the right upper extremity through the right subclavian trunk. From the right side of the thorax, right lung, right side of the heart, and part of the convex surface of the liver through the right bronchomediastinal trunk. These three collecting trunks frequently open separately in the angle of union of the two veins. End of section 44、section 45 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3 by Henry Gray. The Lymphatics of the Head, Face, and Neck. The Lymph Glands of the Head. The lymph glands of the head are arranged in the following groups occipital, posterior auricular, anterior auricular, parotid, Facial, deep facial, lingual, retropharyngeal. The occipital glands, lymphoglandulae occipitalis, one to three in number, are placed on the back of the head close to the margin of the trapezius and resting on the insertion of the semispinalis capitis. Their afferent vessels drain the occipital region of the scalp, while their efferents pass to the superior deep cervical glands. The posterior auricular glands, lymphoglandulae auriculares, mastoid glands, usually two in number, are situated on the mastoid insertion of the sternocleidomastoideus beneath the auricularis posterior. Their afferent vessels drain the posterior part of the temporoparietal region, the upper part of the cranial surface of the auricula or pinna, and the back of the external acoustic meatus. Their efferents pass to the superior deep cervical glands. The anterior auricular glands, lymphoglandulae auricularis anterioris, superficial parotid or pre auricular glands, from one to three in number, lie immediately in front of the tragus. Their efferents drain the lateral surface of the auricula and the skin of the adjacent part of the temporal region. Their efferents pass to the superior deep cervical glands. The parotid glands, lymphoglandulae parotidiae, form two groups in relation with the parotid salivary gland. These are a group embedded in the substance of the gland, and a group of sub parotid glands lying on the lateral wall of the pharynx. Occasionally, small glands are found in the subcutaneous tissue over the parotid gland. Their afferent vessels drain the root of the nose, the eyelids, the frontotemporal region, the external acoustic meatus, and the tympanic cavity, possibly also the posterior parts of the palate and the floor of the nasal cavity. The efferents of these glands pass to the superior deep cervical glands. The afferents of the subparotid glands drain the nasal part of the pharynx and the posterior parts of the nasal cavities. Their efferents pass to the superior deep cervical glands. 
The facial glands comprise three groups. A. Infraorbital or maxillary, scattered over the infraorbital region from the groove between the nose and cheek to the zygomatic arch. B. Buccinator, one or more placed on the buccinator opposite the angle of the mouth. C. Supramandibular, on the outer surface of the mandible, in front of the masseter, and in contact with the external maxillary artery and anterior facial vein. Their efferent vessels drain the eyelids, the conjunctiva, and the skin and mucous membrane of the nose and cheek. Their efferents pass to the submaxillary glands. The deep facial glands, lymphoglanduli facialis profunda, internal maxillary glands, are placed beneath the ramus of the mandible, on the outer surface of the pterygoideus externus, in relation to the internal maxillary artery. Their afferent vessels drain the temporal and infratemporal fossae and the nasal part of the pharynx. Their efferents pass to the superior deep cervical glands. The lingual glands, lymphoglanduli linguales, are two or three small nodules lying on the hyoglossus and under the genioglossus. They form merely glandular substations in the course of the lymphatic vessels of the tongue. The retropharyngeal glands, from one to three in number, lie in the buccopharyngeal fascia, behind the upper part of the pharynx and in front of the arch of the atlas, being separated, however, from the latter by the longus capitis. Their afferents drain the nasal cavities, the nasal part of the pharynx, and the auditory tubes. Their efferents pass to the superior deep cervical glands. The lymphatic vessels of the scalp are divisible into a. those of the frontal region, which terminate in the anterior auricular and parotid glands, b. those of the temporoparietal region, which end in the parotid and posterior auricular glands, and c. those of the occipital region, which terminate partly in the occipital glands and partly in a trunk which runs down along the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoideus to end in the inferior deep cervical glands. The lymphatic vessels of the auricula and external acoustic meatus are also divisible into three groups. A. An anterior, from the lateral surface of the auricula and anterior wall of the meatus to the anterior auricular glands. B a posterior, from the margin of the auricula, the upper part of its cranial surface, the internal surface and posterior wall of the meatus to the posterior auricular and superficial deep cervical glands. c. An inferior, from the floor of the meatus and from the lobule of the auricula to the superficial and superior deep cervical glands. The lymphatic vessels of the face are more numerous than those of the scalp. Those from the eyelids and conjunctiva terminate partly in the submaxillary, but mainly in the parotid glands. The vessels from the posterior part of the cheek also pass to the parotid glands, while those from the anterior portion of the cheek, the side of the nose, the upper lip, and the lateral portions of the lower lip end in the submaxillary glands. The deeper vessels from the temporal and infratemporal fossae pass to the deep facial and superior deep cervical glands. The deeper vessels of the cheek and lips end, like the superficial, in the submaxillary glands. Both superficial and deep vessels of the central part of the lower lip run to the submental glands. Lymphatic Vessels of the Nasal Cavities those from the anterior parts of the nasal cavities communicate with the vessels of the integument of the nose, and end in the submaxillary glands. Those from the posterior two-thirds of the nasal cavities, and from the accessory air sinuses, pass partly to the retropharyngeal, and partly to the superior deep cervical glands. Lymphatic Vessels of the Mouth The vessels of the gums pass to the submaxillary glands. Those of the hard palate are continuous in front with those of the upper gum, but pass backward to pierce the constrictor pharyngeus superior, and end in the superior deep cervical and subparotid glands. Those of the soft palate pass backward and lateralward, 
and end partly in the retropharyngeal and subparotid, and partly in the superior deep cervical glands. The vessels of the anterior part of the floor of the mouth pass either directly to the inferior glands of the superior deep cervical group, or indirectly through the submental glands. From the rest of the floor of the mouth, the vessels pass to the submaxillary and superior deep cervical glands. The lymphatic vessels of the palatine tonsil, usually three to five in number, pierce the buccopharyngeal fascia and constrictor pharyngeus superior, and pass between the stylohyoideus and internal jugular vein to the uppermost of the superior deep cervical glands. They end in a gland which lies at the side of the posterior belly of the digastricus on the internal jugular vein. Occasionally one or two additional vessels run to small glands on the lateral side of the vein under cover of the sternocleidomastoideus. The lymphatic vessels of the tongue are drained chiefly into the deep cervical glands lying between the posterior belly of the digastricus and the superior belly of the omohyoideus. One gland situated at the bifurcation of the common carotid artery is so intimately associated with these vessels that it is known as the principal gland of the tongue. The lymphatic vessels of the tongue may be divided into four groups. One apical, from the tip of the tongue to the suprahyoid glands and principal gland of the tongue. 2. Lateral, from the margin of the tongue. Some of these pierce the mylohyoideus to end in the submaxillary glands. Others pass down on the hyoglossus to the superior deep cervical glands. 3. Basal, from the region of the valate papillae to the superior deep cervical glands and 4. Median, a few of which perforate the mylohyoideus to reach the submaxillary gland, while the majority turn around the posterior border of the muscle to enter the superior deep cervical glands. The lymph glands of the neck. The lymph glands of the neck include the following groups, submaxillary, submental, superficial cervical, anterior cervical, deep cervical, the submaxillary glands, lymphoglandulae submaxillaris, three to six in number, are placed beneath the body of the mandible in the submaxillary triangle, and rest on the superficial surface of the submaxillary salivary gland. One gland, the middle gland of star, which lies on the external maxillary artery as it turns over the mandible, is the most constant of the series. Small lymph glands are sometimes found on the deep surface of the submaxillary salivary glands. The afferents of the submaxillary glands drain the medial papebral commissure, the cheek, the side of the nose, the upper lip, the lateral part of the lower lip, the gums, and the anterior part of the margin of the tongue. Efferent vessels from the facial and submental glands also enter the submaxillary glands. Their efferent vessels pass to the superior deep cervical glands. The submental or suprahyoid glands are situated between the anterior bellies of the digastrici. Their afferents drain the central portions of the lower lip and floor of the mouth and the apex of the tongue. Their efferents pass partly to the submaxillary glands and partly to a gland of the deep cervical group situated on the internal jugular vein at the level of the cricoid cartilage. The superficial cervical glands, lymphoglandulae cervicalis superficialis, lie in close relationship with the external jugular vein as it emerges from the parotid gland, and, therefore, superficial to the sternocleidomastoideus. Their afferents drain the lower parts of the auricula and parotid region, while their efferents pass around the anterior margin of the sternocleidomastoideus to join the superior deep cervical glands. The anterior cervical glands form an irregular and inconstant group on the front of the larynx and trachea. They may be divided into a. a superficial set placed on the anterior jugular vein, b. a deeper set 
which is further subdivided into prelaryngeal, on the middle cricothyroid ligament, and pretracheal, on the front of the trachea. This deeper set drains the lower part of the larynx, the thyroid gland, and the upper part of the trachea. Its efferents pass to the lowest of the superior deep cervical glands. The deep cervical glands, lymphoglandulae, cervicales, profundi, are numerous and of large size. They form a chain along the carotid sheath, lying by the side of the pharynx, esophagus, and trachea, and extending from the base of the skull to the root of the neck. They are usually described in two groups. One, the superior deep cervical glands lying under the sternocleidomastoideus, in close relation with the accessory nerve and the internal jugular vein some of the glands lying in front of, and others behind the vessel. 2. The inferior deep cervical glands extending beyond the posterior margin of the sternocleidomastoideus into the supraclavicular triangle, where they are closely related to the brachial plexus and subclavian vein. A few minute paratracheal glands are situated alongside the recurrent nerves on the lateral aspects of the trachea and esophagus. The superior deep cervical glands drain the occipital portion of the scalp, the auricula, the back of the neck, a considerable part of the tongue, the larynx, thyroid gland, trachea, nasal part of the pharynx, nasal cavities, palate, and esophagus. They receive also the efferent vessels from all the other glands of the head and neck, except those from the inferior deep cervical glands. The inferior deep cervical glands drain the back of the scalp and neck, the superficial pectoral region, part of the arm, and occasionally part of the superior surface of the liver. In addition, they receive vessels from the superior deep cervical glands. The efferents of the superior deep cervical glands pass partly to the inferior deep cervical glands and partly to a trunk which unites with the efferent vessel of the inferior deep cervical glands and forms the jugular trunk. On the right side, this trunk ends in the junction of the internal jugular and subclavian veins. On the left side, it joins the thoracic duct. The lymphatic vessels of the skin and muscles of the neck pass to the deep cervical glands. From the upper part of the pharynx, the lymphatic vessels pass to the retropharyngeal, from the lower part to the deep cervical glands. From the larynx, two sets of vessels arise, an upper and a lower. The vessels of the upper set pierce the hyothyroid membrane and join the superior deep cervical glands. Of the lower set, some pierce the conus elasticus and join the pretracheal and prelaryngeal glands. Others run between the cricoid and first tracheal ring and enter the inferior deep cervical glands. The lymphatic vessels of the thyroid gland consist of two sets, an upper, which accompanies the superior thyroid artery and enters the superior deep cervical glands, and a lower, which runs partly to the pretracheal glands and partly to the small paratracheal glands which accompany the recurrent nerves. Section 46 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3, by Henry Gray. Section 46. The Lymphatics of the Upper Extremity. The lymph glands of the upper extremity. The lymph glands of the upper extremity are divided into two sets, superficial and deep. The superficial lymph glands are few and of small size. One or two supratrochlear glands are placed above the medial epicondyle of the humerus, medial to the basilic vein. Their afferents drain the middle, ring and little fingers the medial portion of the hand 
and the superficial area over the ulnar side of the forearm. These vessels are, however, in free communication with the other lymphatic vessels of the forearm. Their efferents accompany the basilic vein and join the deeper vessels. One or two deltoidiopectoral glands are found beside the cephalic vein, between the pectoralis major and deltoideus, immediately below the clavicle. They are situated in the course of the external collecting trunks of the arm. The deep lymph glands are chiefly grouped in the axilla, although a few may be found in the forearm, in the course of the radial, ulnar, and interosseous vessels, and in the arm along the medial side of the brachial artery. The axillary glands, lymphoglandulae axillaries, are of large size, vary from 20 to 30 in number, and may be arranged in the following groups. 1. A lateral group of from 4 to 6 glands lies in relation to the medial and posterior aspects of the axillary vein. The afferents of these glands drain the whole arm with the exception of that portion whose vessels accompany the cephalic vein. The efferent vessels pass partly to the central and subclavicular groups of axillary glands and partly to the inferior deep cervical glands. 2. An anterior or pectoral group consists of four or five glands along the lower border of the pectoralis minor in relation with the lateral thoracic artery. Their afferents drain the skin and muscles of the anterior and lateral thoracic walls and the central and lateral parts of the nama. Their efferents pass partly to the central and partly to the subclavicular groups of axillary glands. 3. A posterior or subscapular group of six or seven glands is placed along the lower margin of the posterior wall of the axilla in the course of the subscapular artery. The afferents of this group drain the skin and muscles of the lower part of the back of the neck and of the posterior thoracic wall. Their efferents pass to the central group of axillary glands. 4. A central or intermediate group of three or four large glands is embedded in the adipose tissue near the base of the axilla. Its afferents are the afferent vessels of all the preceding groups of axillary glands. Its afferents pass to the subclavicular group. 5. A medial or subclavicular group of 6 to 12 glands is situated partly posterior to the upper portion of the pectoralis minor and partly above the upper border of this muscle. Its only direct territorial afferents are those which accompany the cephalic vein and one which drains the upper peripheral part of the mamma, but it receives the afferents of all the other axillary glands. The efferent vessels of the subclavicular group unite to form the subclavian trunk, which opens either directly into the junction of the internal jugular and subclavian veins or into the jugular lymphatic trunk. On the left side, it may end in the thoracic duct. A few efferents from the subclavicular glands usually pass to the inferior deep cervical glands. The lymphatic vessels of the upper extremity. The lymphatic vessels of the upper extremity are divided into two sets, superficial and deep. The superficial lymphatic vessels commence in the lymphatic plexus, which everywhere pervades the skin. The meshes of the plexus are much finer in the palm and on the flexor aspect of the digits than elsewhere. The digital plexuses are drained by a pair of vessels which run on the sides of each digit and incline backward to reach the dorsum of the hand.
From the dense plexus of the palm, vessels pass in different directions, viz., upward toward the wrist, downward to join the digital vessels, medialward to join the vessels on the ulnar border of the hand, and lateralward to those on the thumb. Several vessels from the central part of the plexus unite to form a trunk, which passes around the metacarpal bone of the index finger to join the vessels on the back of that digit and on the back of the thumb. Running upward in front of and behind the wrist, the lymphatic vessels are collected into radial, median, and ulnar groups, which accompany respectively the cephalic, median, and basilic veins in the forearm. A few of the ulnar lymphatics end in the supratrochlear glands, but the majority pass directly to the lateral group of axillary glands. Some of the radial vessels are collected into a trunk, which ascends with the cephalic vein to the deltoidiopectoral glands. The efferents from this group pass either to the subclavicular axillary glands or to the inferior cervical glands. The deep lymphatic vessels accompany the deep blood vessels. In the forearm, they consist of four sets, corresponding with the radial, ulnar, volar, and dorsal interosseous arteries. They communicate at intervals with the superficial lymphatics, and some of them end in the glands which are occasionally found beside the arteries. In their course upward, a few end in the glands which lie upon the brachial artery, but most Section 47 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3, by Henry Gray. The Lymphatics of the Lower Extremity The Lymph Glands of the Lower Extremity The Lymph Glands of the Lower Extremity consist of the anterior tibial gland, and the popliteal and inguinal glands. The anterior tibial gland, lymphoglandula tibialis anterior, is small and inconstant. It lies on the interosseous membrane in relation to the upper part of the anterior tibial vessels and constitutes a substation in the course of the anterior tibial lymphatic trunks. The popliteal glands, lymphoglandulae popliteae, small in size and some six or seven in number, are embedded in the fat contained in the popliteal fossa. One lies immediately beneath the popliteal fascia, near the terminal part of the small saphenous vein, and drains the region from which this vein derives its tributaries. Another is placed between the popliteal artery and the posterior surface of the knee joint. It receives the lymphatic vessels from the knee joint together with those which accompany the genicular arteries. The others lie at the sides of the popliteal vessels and receive as efferents the trunks, which accompany the anterior and posterior tibial vessels. The efferents of the popliteal glands pass almost entirely alongside the femoral vessels to the deep inguinal glands, but a few may accompany the great saphenous vein and end in the glands of the superficial subinguinal group. The inguinal glands, lymphoglandulae inguinales, from 12 to 20 in number, are situated at the upper part of the femoral triangle. They may be divided into two groups by a horizontal line at the level of the termination of the great saphenous vein, those lying above this line are termed the superficial inguinal glands, and those below it the subinguinal glands, the latter group consisting of a superficial and a deep set. The superficial inguinal glands form a chain immediately below the inguinal ligament. They receive as afferents lymphatic vessels from the integument of the penis, scrotum, perineum, buttock and abdominal wall below the level of the umbilicus. 
The superficial subinguinal glands, lymphoglandulae, subinguinales, superficiales, are placed on either side of the upper part of the great saphenous vein. Their efferents consist chiefly of the superficial lymphatic vessels of the lower extremity, but they also receive some of the vessels which drain the integument of the penis, scrotum, perineum, and buttock. The deep subinguinal glands, lymphoglandulae subinguinales profunde vary from one to three in number and are placed under the fascia lata on the medial side of the femoral vein when three are present the lowest is situated just below the junction of the great saphenous and femoral veins the middle in the femoral canal and the highest in the lateral part of the femoral ring the middle one is the most inconstant of the three, but the highest, the gland of Cloquet or Rosenmuller, is also frequently absent. They receive as afferents the deep lymphatic trunks, which accompany the femoral vessels. The lymphatics from the glands penis fell clitoridis and also some of the efferents from the superficial subinguinal glands. The lymphatic vessels of the lower extremity the lymphatic vessels of the lower extremity consist of two sets, superficial and deep, and in their distribution correspond closely with the veins. The superficial lymphatic vessels lie in the superficial fascia and are divisible into two groups, a medial, which follows the course of the great saphenous vein, and a lateral, which accompanies the small saphenous vein. The vessels of the medial group are larger and more numerous than those of the lateral group, and commence on the tibial side and dorsum of the foot. They ascend both in front of and behind the medial malleolus, run up the leg with the great saphenous vein, pass with it behind the medial condyle of the femur, and accompany it to the groin, where they end in the subinguinal group of superficial glands. The vessels of the lateral group arise from the fibular side of the foot. Some ascend in front of the leg and, just below the knee, cross the tibia to join the lymphatics on the medial side of the thigh. Others pass behind the lateral malleolus and, accompanying the small saphenous vein, enter popliteal glands. The deep lymphatic vessels are few in number and accompany the deep blood vessels in the leg, they consist of three sets, the anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and peroneal, which accompany the corresponding blood vessels, two or three with each artery. They enter the popliteal lymph glands. The deep lymphatic vessels of the gluteal and ischial regions follow the course of the corresponding blood vessels. Those accompanying the superior gluteal vessels end in a gland which lies on the intrapelvic portion of the superior gluteal artery near the upper border of the greater sciatic foramen. Those following the inferior gluteal vessels traverse one or two small glands which lie below the piriformis muscle. Section 48 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Stearns. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3, by Henry Gray. Lymphatics of the Abdomen and Pelvis, Part 1. The Lymph Glands of the abdomen and pelvis may be divided from the situations into a parietal lying behind the peritoneum and in close association with the larger blood vessels and b visceral which are found in relation to the visceral arteries the parietal glands include the following groups external iliac common iliac epigastric iliac circumflex hypogastric, sacral, lumbar, lateral aortic, pre-aortic, retroaortic.
the external iliac glands, from eight to ten in number, lie along the external iliac vessels. They are arranged in three groups, one on the lateral, another on the medial, and a third on the anterior aspect of the vessels. The third group is, however, sometimes absent. Their principal afferents are derived from the inguinal and subinguinal glands. The deep lymphatics of the abdominal wall below the umbilicus and of the adductor region of the thigh and the lymphatics from the glans penis vel from the glans penis vel clitoridis the membranous urethra the prostate the fundus of the bladder the cervix uteri and upper part of the vagina the common iliac glands four to six in number are grouped behind and on the sides of the common iliac artery one or two being placed below the bifurcation of the aorta in front of the fifth lumbar vertebra they drain chiefly the hypogastric and external iliac glands and their efferents pass to the lateral aortic glands the epigastric glands lymphoglandulo epigastrico three or four in number are placed alongside the lower portion of the inferior epigastric vessels the iliac circumflex glands two to four in number are situated along the course of the deep iliac circumflex vessels they are sometimes absent the hypogastric glands lymphoglandulo hypogastrico internal iliac gland surround the hypogastric vessels and receive the lymphatics corresponding to the distribution of the branches of the hypogastric artery that is they receive lymphatics from the pelvic viscera from the deeper parts of the perineum including the membranous and cavernous portions of the urethra and from the buttock and back of the thigh an obturator gland is sometimes seen in the upper part of the obturator foramen the sacral glands are placed in the concavity of the sacrum in relation to the middle and lateral sacral arteries they receive lymphatics from the rectum and posterior wall of the pelvis the efferents of the hypogastric group end in the common iliac glands. The lumbar glands, lymphoglandulo lumbalis, are very numerous, and consist of right and left lateral aortic, pre-aortic, and retroaortic groups. The right lateral aortic glands are situated partly in front of the inferior vena cava, near the termination of the renal vein, and partly behind it on the origin of the psoas major, and on the right cruce of the diaphragm. The left lateral aortic glands form a chain on the left side of the abdominal aorta in front of the origin of the psoas major and left cruce of the diagram. The glands on either side receive a. the efferents of the common iliac glands, b. the lymphatics from the testes in the male and from the ovary, uterine tube, and body of the uterus in the female, c. the lymphatics from the kidney and suprarenal gland, and d the lymphatics draining the lateral abdominal muscles and accompanying the lumbar veins most of the efferent vessels of the lateral aortic glands converge to form the right and left lumbar trunks which join the cisterna chile but some enter the pre and retro aortic glands and others pierce the crua of the diaphragm to join the lower end of the thoracic duct the pre-aortic glands lie in front of the aorta and may be divided into celiac, superior mesenteric, and inferior mesenteric groups, arranged around the origins of the corresponding arteries. They receive a few vessels from the lateral aortic glands, but their principal afferents are derived from the viscera supplied by the three arteries with which they are associated. Some of the efferents pass to the retroaortic glands, but the majority unite to form the intestinal trunk, which enters the cisterna chile. The retroaortic glands are passed below the cisterna chile on the bodies of the third and fourth lumbar vertebrae. They receive lymphatic trunks from the lateral and preaortic glands, while their efferents end in the cisterna chile. The lymphatic vessels of the abdomen and pelvis. The lymphatic vessels of the walls of the abdomen and pelvis may be divided into two sets superficial and deep the superficial vessels follow the course of the superficial blood vessels and converge to the superficial inguinal glands those derived from the integument 
of the front of the abdomen below the umbilicus follow the course of the superficial epigastric vessels and those from the sides of the lumbar part of the abdominal wall pass along the crest of the ilium with the superficial iliac circumflex vessels the superficial lymphatic vessels of the gluteal region turn horizontally around the buttock and join the superficial inguinal and subinguinal glands the deep vessels run alongside the principal blood vessels those are the parietes of the pelvis which accompany the superior and inferior gluteal and umturator vessels follow the course of the hypogastric artery and ultimately join the lateral aortic glands lymphatic vessels of the perineum and external genitals the lymphatic vessels of the perineum of the integument of the penis and of the scrotum or vulva follow the course of the external pudendal vessels and end in the superficial inguinal and subinguinal glands those of the glands penis vel clitoridis terminate partly in the subinguinal glands and partly in the external iliac glands the visceral glands are associated with the branches of the celiac superior and inferior mesenteric arteries those related to the branches of the celiac artery form three sets gastric hepatic and pancreaticolino the gastric glands consist of two sets superior and inferior the superior gastric glands lymphoblandulo gastrico superioris accompany the left gastric artery and are divisible into three groups namely a upper on the stem of the artery b lower accompanying the descending branches of the artery along the cardiac half of the lesser curvature of the stomach between the two layers of the lesser omentum and c pericardial outlying members of the gastric glands disposed in a manner comparable to a chain of beads around the neck of the stomach jameson and dobson they receive their afferents from the stomach their afferents pass to the celiac group of the pre-aortic glands the inferior gastric glands lymphoglandulo gastrico inferioris right gastric epilogic gland four to seven in number lie between the two layers of the greater omentum along the pyloric half of the greater curvature of the stomach the hepatic glands lymphoglandulo hepatico consist of the following groups a hepatic on the stem of the hepatic artery and extending upward along the common bile duct between the two layers of the lesser omentum as far as the border hepatis the cystic gland a member of this group is placed near the neck of the gallbladder b subpyloric four or five in number in close relation to the bifurcation of the gastroduodenal artery in the angle between the superior and descending parts of the duodenum an outlying member of this group is sometimes found above the duodenum on the right gastric pyloric artery the glands of the hepatic chain receive efferents from the stomach duodenum liver gallbladder and pancreas their efferents join the celiac group of pre-aortic glands the pancreaticolino glands lymphoglandiole pancreaticolinalis splenic glands accompany the lenal splenic artery and are situated in relation to the posterior surface of the upper border of the pancreas one or two members of this group are found in the gastrolenal ligament jameson and dobson in the work that was cited their afferents are derived from the stomach spleen and pancreas their efferents join the celiac group of the pre-aortic glands the superior mesenteric glands may be divided into three principal groups mesenteric iliacolic and mesocolic the mesenteric glands lymphoglandulo mesenterico lie between the layers of the mesentery they vary from one hundred to one hundred and fifty in number and may be grouped into three sets namely one lying close to the wall of the small intestine among the terminal twigs of the superior mesenteric artery a second in relation to the loops and primary branches of the vessels and a third along the trunk of the artery the iliacolic glands from ten to twenty in number form a chain around the iliacolic artery but show a tendency to subdivision into two groups one near the duodenum and another on the lower part of the trunk of the artery where the vessel divides into its terminal branches the chain is broken up into several groups namely a ileal the region in the ileal branch of the artery b 
anterior iliocolic, usually of three glands, in the iliocolic fold, near the wall of the cecum. C. Posterior iliocolic, mostly placed in the angle between the ilium and the colon, but partly lying behind the cecum, at its junction with the ascending colon. D. A single gland between the layers of the mes anterior of the vermiform process. E. Right colic, along the medial side of the ascending colon. The mesocolic glands, lymphoglandulo mesocolico, are numerous and lie between the layers of the transverse mesocolon in close relation to the transverse colon. They are best developed in the neighborhood of the right and left colic flexures. One or two small glands are occasionally seen along the trunk of the right colic artery, and others are found in relation to the trunk and branches of the middle colic artery. The superior mesenteric glands receive afferents from the jejunum, ilium, cecum, vermiform process, and the ascending and transverse parts of the colon. Their efferents pass to the pre-aortic glands. The inferior mesenteric glands consist of a. Small glands on the branches of the left colic and sigmoid arteries, b. A group in the sigmoid mesocolon around the superior hemorrhoidal artery, and c. A pararectal group in contact with the muscular coat of the rectum. They drain the descending iliac and sigmoid parts of the colon and the upper part of the rectum. The effort Section 49 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Stearns. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3, by Henry Gray. Lymphatics of the Abdomen and Pelvis, Part 2. The Lymphatic Vessels of the Abdomen and Pelvic Viscera. The lymphatic vessels of the abdominal and pelvic visceral consist of one, those of the subdiaphragmic portion of the digestive tube and its associated glands, the liver and pancreas, two, those of the spleen and suprarenal glands, three, those of the urinary organs, four, those of the reproductive organs, one. The lymphatic vessels of the subdiaphragmatic portion of the digestive tube are situated partly in the mucous membrane and partly in the seromuscular coats, but as the former system drains into the latter, the two may be considered as one. The lymphatic vessels of the stomach are continuous at the cardiac orifice with those of the esophagus, and at the pylorus with those of the duodenum. They mainly follow the blood vessels and may be arranged in four sets. Those of the first set accompany the branches of the left gastric artery, receiving tributaries from a large area on either surface of the stomach, and terminate in the superior gastric glands. Those of the second set drain the fundus and body of the stomach on the left of a line drawn vertically from the esophagus. They accompany, more or less closely, the short gastric and left gastroepilotic arteries, and end in the pancreaticolenal glands. The vessels of the third set drain the right portion of the greater curvature as far as the pyloric portion and end in the inferior gastric glands, the efferents of which pass to the subpyloric group. Those of the fourth set drain the pyloric portion and pass to the hepatic and subpyloric glands and to the superior gastric glands. The lymphatic vessels of the duodenum consist of an anterior and posterior set, which open into a series of small pancreatical duodenal glands on the anterior and posterior aspects of the groove behind the head of the pancreas and the duodenum. The efferents of these glands run in two directions, upward to the hepatic glands and downward to the preaortic glands around the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. The lymphatic vessels of the jejunum and ilium are termed lacteals from the milk-white fluid they contain during intestinal digestion. They run between the layers of the mesentery and enter the mesenteric glands, the efferents of which end in the preaortic glands. The lymphatic vessels of the vermiform process and cecum are numerous, 
since in the wall of this process there is a large amount of adenoid tissue from the body and tail of the vermiform process eight to fifteen vessels ascend between the layers of the mes anterior, one or two being interrupted in the gland which lies between the layers of this peritoneal fold they unite to form three or four vessels which end partly in the lower and partly in the upper glands of the iliocolic chain the vessels from the root of the vermiform process and from the cecum consist of an anterior and posterior group the anterior vessels pass in front of the cecum and end in the anterior iliocolic glands and in the upper and lower glands of the iliocolic chain the posterior vessels ascend over the back of the cecum and terminate in the posterior iliocolic glands and in the lower glands of the iliocolic chain lymphatic vessels of the colon the lymphatic vessels of the ascending and transverse parts of the colon finally end in the mesenteric glands after transversing the right colic and mesocolic glands those of the descending and iliac sigmoid parts of the colon are interrupted by the small glands on the branches of the left colic and sigmoid arteries and ultimately end in the pre-aortic glands around the origin of the inferior mesenteric artery lymphatic vessels of the anus anal canal and rectum the lymphatics from the anus pass forward and end with those of the integument of the perineum and scrotum in the superficial inguinal glands those from the anal cavity accompany the middle and inferior hemorrhoidal arteries and end at the hypogastric glands while the vessels from the rectum traverse the pararectal glands and pass to those in the sigmoid mesocolon the efferents of the latter terminate in the pre-aortic glands around the origin of the inferior mesenteric artery the lymphatic vessels of the liver are divisible into two sets superficial and deep the former arise in the subperitoneal areolar tissue over the entire surface of the organ and may be grouped into a those on the convex surface b those on the inferior surface a on the convex surface the vessels from the back part of this surface reach their terminal glands by three different routes the vessels of the middle set five or six in number pass through the vena cava foramen in the diaphragm and end in one or two glands which are situated around the terminal part of the inferior vena cava a few vessels on the left side pass backward toward the esophageal hiatus and terminate in the pericardial group of superior gastric glands the vessels from the right side one or two in number, run on the abdominal surface of the diaphragm, and after crossing its right crus, end in the preaortic glands which surround the origin of the celiac artery. From the portions of the right and left lobes adjacent to the falciform ligament, the lymphatic vessels converge to form two trunks, one of which accompanies the inferior vena cava through the diaphragm, and ends in the glands around the terminal part of this vessel. The other runs downward and forward, and turning around the anterior sharp margin of the liver, accompanies the upper part of the ligamentum teres and ends in the upper hepatic glands. From the anterior surface, a few additional vessels turn around the anterior sharp margin to reach the upper hepatic glands. B. On the inferior surface. The vessels from this surface mostly converge to the porta hepatis and accompany the deep lymphatics emerging from the porta to the hepatic glands one or two from the posterior parts of the right and caudal lobes accompany the inferior vena cava through the diaphragm and end in the glands around the terminal part of this vein the deep lymphatics converge to ascending and descending trunks the ascending trunks accompany the hepatic veins and pass through the diaphragm to end in the glands around the terminal part of the inferior vena cava the descending trunks emerge from the porta hepatis and end in the hepatic glands lymphatic vessels of the gallbladder pass to the hepatic glands in the porta hepatis those of the common bile duct to the hepatic glands alongside the duct and to the upper pancreato duodenal glands the lymphatic vessels of the pancreas follow the course of its blood vessels most of them enter the pancreatolanal glands but some end in the pancreato duodenal glands and others in the pre-aortic glands near the origin of the superior mesenteric artery two the lymphatic vessels of the spleen and suprarenal glands the lymphatic vessels of the spleen both superficial and deep pass to the pancreatal lenal glands the lymphatic vessels of the suprarenal glands 
usually accompany the suprarenal veins and end in the lateral aortic glands. Occasionally, some of them pierce the crora of the diaphragm and end in the glands of the posterior mediastinum. 3. The lymphatic vessels of the urinary organs. The lymphatic vessels of the kidney form three plexuses, one in the substance of the kidney, a second beneath its fibrous capsule, and a third in the paraniferic fat. The second and third communicate freely with each other. The vessels from the plexus in the kidney substance converge to form four or five trunks which issue at the hilum. Here they are joined by vessels from the plexus under the capsule, and following the course of the renal vein, end in the lateral aortic glands. The perinephric plexus is drained directly into the upper lateral aortic glands. The lymphatic vessels of the ureter run in different directions. Those from its upper portion end partly in the efferent vessels of the kidney and partly in the lateral aortic glands. Those from the portion immediately above the brim of the lesser pelvis are drained into the common iliac glands, while the vessels from the interpelvic portion of the tube either join the efferents from the bladder or end in the hypogastric glands. The lymphatic vessels of the bladder originate in two plexuses, an intra and extra muscular. It being generally admitted, the mucous membrane is devoid of lymphatics. Footnote. Some authorities maintain that a plexus of lymphatic vessels does exist in the mucous membrane of the bladder. Consult Médecine Operateur des Voies Urinaires par J. Eberin, Paris, 1909. End footnote. The efferent vessels are arranged in two groups, one from the anterior and one another from the posterior surface of the bladder. The vessels from the anterior surface pass to the external iliac glands, but in the course minute glands are situated. These minute glands are arranged in two groups, an anterior vesicle in front of the bladder, and a lateral vesicle in relation to the lateral umbilical ligament. The vessels from the posterior surface pass to the hypogastric external and common iliac glands. Those draining the upper part of this surface traverse the lateral vesicle glands. The lymphatic vessels of the prostate terminate chiefly in the hypogastric and sacral glands, but one trunk from the posterior surface ends in the external iliac glands, and another from the anterior surface joins the vessels which drain the membranous part of the urethra. Lymphatic vessels of the urethra. The lymphatics of the cavernous portion of the urethra accompany those of the glans penis and terminate with them in the deep subinguinal and external iliac glands. Those of the membranous and prostatic portions and those of the whole urethra in the female pass to the hypogastric glands. 4. The lymphatic vessels of the reproductive organs. The lymphatic vessels of the testes consist of two sets, superficial and deep, the former commencing on the surface of the tunica vaginalis, the latter in the epididymis and body of the testes. They form from four to eight collecting trunks which ascend with the spermatic veins in the spermatic cord and along the front of the psoas major to the level where the spermatic vessels cross the ureter and end in the lateral and pre-aortic groups of lumbar glands. The lymphatic vessels of the ductus deferens pass to the external iliac glands, those of the vesiculae, seminalis, partly to the hypogastric and partly to the external glands. The lymphatic vessels of the ovary are similar to those of the testes and descend with the ovarian artery to the lateral and pre-aortic glands. The lymphatic vessels of the uterine tube pass partly with those of the ovary and partly with those of the uterus. The lymphatic vessels of the uterus consist of two sets, superficial and deep, the former being placed beneath the peritoneum, the latter in the substance of the organ. The lymphatics of the cervix uteri run in three directions, transversely to the external iliac glands, posterior laterally to the hypogastric glands, and posteriorly to the common iliac glands. The majority of the vessels of the body and fundus of the uterus pass lateral wood in the broad ligaments and are continued up with ovarian vessels to the lateral and pre-aortic glands. A few, however, run to the external iliac glands and one or two to the superficial inguinal glands. In the unimpregnated uterus, the lymphatic vessels are very small, but during gestation they are greatly enlarged. The lymphatic vessels of the vagina are carried in three directions those of the upper part of the vagina to the external iliac glands, those of the middle part to the hypogastric glands, and those of the lower part to the common iliac glands. 
On the course of the vessels, for the middle and lower parts, small glands are situated. Some lymphatic vessels, from the lower part of the vagina, join those of the vulva, and pass in the superficial inguinal glands. The lymphatics of the vagina, anastomos, Section 50 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 3, by Henry Gray. The Lymphatic Vessels of the Thorax. The lymph glands of the thorax may be divided into parietal and visceral the former being situated in the thoracic wall, the latter in relation to the viscera. The parietal lymph glands include the sternal, intercostal, and diaphragmatic glands. 1. The sternal glands, lymphoglandulae sternales, internal mammary glands, are placed at the anterior ends of the intercostal spaces by the side of the internal mammary artery. They derive afferents from the mamma, from the deeper structures of the anterior abdominal wall above the level of the umbilicus, from the upper surface of the liver through a small group of glands which lie behind the xiphoid process, and from the deeper parts of the anterior portion of the thoracic wall. Their efferents usually unite to form a single trunk on either side. This may open directly into the junction of the internal jugular and subclavian veins, or that of the right side may join the right subclavian trunk, and that of the left, the thoracic duct. 2. The intercostal glands, lymphoglandulae intercostales, occupy the posterior parts of the intercostal spaces, in relation to the intercostal vessels. They receive the deep lymphatics from the posterolateral aspect of the chest. Some of these vessels are interrupted by small lateral intercostal glands. The efferents of the glands in the lower four or five spaces unite to form a trunk, which descends and opens either into the cisterna chile or into the commencement of the thoracic duct. The efferents of the glands in the upper spaces of the left side end in the thoracic duct, those of the corresponding right spaces in the right lymphatic duct. 3. The diaphragmatic glands lie on the thoracic aspect of the diaphragm and consist of three sets, anterior, middle, and posterior. The anterior set comprises a. Two or three small glands behind the base of the xiphoid process, which receive afferents from the convex surface of the liver, and b. One or two glands on either side near the junction of the seventh rib with its cartilage, which receive lymphatic vessels from the front part of the diaphragm. The efferent vessels of the anterior set pass to the sternal glands. The middle set consists of two or three glands on either side, close to where the phrenic nerves enter the diaphragm. On the right side, some of the glands of this group lie within the fibrous sac of the pericardium, on the front of the termination of the inferior vena cava. The afferents of this set are derived from the middle part of the diaphragm, those on the right side also receiving afferents from the convex surface of the liver. Their efferents pass to the posterior mediastinal glands. The posterior set consists of a few glands situated on the back of the crura of the diaphragm, and connected, on the one hand, with the lumbar glands, and, on the other, with the posterior mediastinal glands. The superficial lymphatic vessels of the thoracic wall ramify beneath the skin and converge to the axillary glands. Those over the trapezius and latissimus dorsi run forward and unite to form about ten or twelve trunks which end in the subscapular group. Those over the pectoral region, including the vessels from the skin covering the peripheral part of the mamma, run backward and those over the serratus anterior, upward, to the pectoral group. Others near the lateral margin of the sternum pass inward between the rib cartilages, and end in the sternal glands, 
while the vessels of opposite sides anastomose across the front of the sternum. A few vessels from the upper part of the pectoral region ascend over the clavicle to the supraclavicular group of cervical glands. The lymphatic vessels of the mamma originate in a plexus in the interlobular spaces and on the walls of the galactophorus ducts. Those from the central part of the gland pass to an intricate plexus situated beneath the areola, a plexus which receives also the lymphatics from the skin over the central part of the gland and those from the areola and nipple. Its efferents are collected into two trunks which pass to the pectoral group of axillary glands. The vessels which drain the medial part of the mamma pierce the thoracic wall and end in the sternal glands, while a vessel has occasionally been seen to emerge from the upper part of the mamma and, piercing the pectoralis major, terminate in the subclavicular glands. The deep lymphatic vessels of the thoracic wall consist of 1. The lymphatics of the muscles which lie on the ribs. Most of these end in the axillary glands, but some from the pectoralis major pass to the sternal glands. 2. The intercostal vessels which drain the intercostales and parietal pleura. Those draining the intercostales externi run backward, and, after receiving the vessels which accompany the posterior branches of the intercostal arteries, end in the intercostal glands. Those of the intercostales interni and parietal pleura consist of a single trunk in each space. These trunks run forward in the subpleural tissue, and the upper six open separately into the sternal glands or into the vessels which unite them. Those of the lower spaces unite to form a single trunk, which terminates in the lowest of the sternal glands. 3. The lymphatic vessels of the diaphragm, which form two plexuses, one on its thoracic and another on its abdominal surface. These plexuses anastomose freely with each other, and are best marked on the parts covered, respectively, by the pleury and peritoneum. That on the thoracic surface communicates with the lymphatics of the costal and mediastinal parts of the pleura, and its efferents consist of three groups. A. Anterior, passing to the gland which lies near the junction of the seventh rib with its cartilage. B. Middle, to the glands on the esophagus and to those around the termination of the inferior vena cava. And C. Posterior, to the glands which surround the aorta, at the point where this vessel leaves the thoracic cavity. The plexus on the abdominal surface is composed of fine vessels, and anastomoses with the lymphatics of the liver, and, at the periphery of the diaphragm, with those of the subperitoneal tissue. The efferents from the right half of this plexus terminate partly in a group of glands on the trunk of the corresponding inferior phrenic artery while others end in the right lateral aortic glands. Those from the left half of the plexus pass to the pre- and lateral aortic glands, and to the glands on the terminal portion of the esophagus. The visceral lymph glands consist of three groups, that is, anterior mediastinal, posterior mediastinal, and tracheobronchial. The anterior mediastinal glands lymphoglanduli mediastinales anteriores, are placed in the anterior part of the superior mediastinal cavity, in front of the aortic arch, and in relation to the innominate veins and the large arterial trunks which arise from the aortic arch. They receive afferents from the thymus and pericardium, and from the sternal glands. Their efferents unite with those of the tracheobronchial glands, to form the right and left bronchomediastinal trunks. The posterior mediastinal glands, lymphoglanduli mediastinales posteriores, lie behind the pericardium in relation to the esophagus and descending thoracic aorta. Their afferents are derived from the esophagus, the posterior part of the pericardium, the diaphragm, and the convex surface of the liver. Their efferents mostly end in the thoracic duct, but some join the tracheobronchial glands. The tracheobronchial glands form four main groups. A. Tracheal, on either side of the trachea. B. 
bronchial, in the angles between the lower part of the trachea and bronchi, and in the angle between the two bronchi. C. Bronchopulmonary, in the hilus of each lung, and D. Pulmonary, in the lung substance, on the larger branches of the bronchi. The afferents of the tracheobronchial glands drain the lungs and bronchi, the thoracic part of the trachea, and the heart. Some of the efferents of the posterior mediastinal glands also end in this group. Their efferent vessels ascend upon the trachea and unite with efferents of the internal mammary and anterior mediastinal glands to form the right and left bronchomediastinal trunks. The right bronchomediastinal trunk may join the right lymphatic duct and the left the thoracic duct, but more frequently they open independently of these ducts into the junction of the internal jugular and subclavian veins of their own side. In all town dwellers there are continually being swept into these glands from the bronchi and alveoli large quantities of the dust and black carbonaceous pigment that are so freely inhaled in cities. At first the glands are moderately enlarged, firm, inky black, and gritty on section. Later they enlarge still further, often becoming fibrous from the irritation set up by the minute foreign bodies with which they are crammed, and may break down into a soft, slimy mass, or may calcify. The lymphatic vessels of the thoracic viscera comprise those of the heart and pericardium, lungs and pleura, thymus and esophagus. The lymphatic vessels of the heart consist of two plexuses, A, deep, immediately under the endocardium, and B, superficial, subjacent to the visceral pericardium. The deep plexus opens into the superficial, the efferents of which form right and left collecting trunks. The left trunks, two or three in number, ascend in the anterior longitudinal sulcus, receiving, in their course, vessels from both ventricles. On reaching the coronary sulcus they are joined by a large trunk from the diaphragmatic surface of the heart and then unite to form a single vessel which ascends between the pulmonary artery and the left atrium, and ends in one of the tracheobronchial glands. The right trunk receives its afferents from the right atrium and from the right border and diaphragmatic surface of the right ventricle. It ascends in the posterior longitudinal sulcus, and then runs forward in the coronary sulcus and passes up behind the pulmonary artery to end in one of the tracheobronchial glands. The lymphatic vessels of the lungs originate in two plexuses, a superficial and a deep. The superficial plexus is placed beneath the pulmonary pleura. The deep accompanies the branches of the pulmonary vessels and the ramifications of the bronchi. In the case of the larger bronchi, the deep plexus consists of two networks, one submucus between the mucous membrane, and another peribronchial outside the walls of the bronchi. In the smaller bronchi there is but a single plexus, which extends as far as the bronchioles, but fails to reach the alveoli, in the walls of which there are no traces of lymphatic vessels. The superficial efferents turn around the borders of the lungs and the margins of their fissures and converge to end in some glands situated at the hilus. The deep efferents are conducted to the hilus along the pulmonary vessels and bronchi, and end in the tracheobronchial glands. Little or no anastomosis occurs between the superficial and deep lymphatics of the lungs, except in the region of the hilus. The lymphatic vessels of the pleura consist of two sets, one in the visceral, and another in the parietal part of the membrane. Those of the visceral pleura drain into the superficial efferents of the lung, while the lymphatics of the parietal pleura have three modes of ending. These are a. Those of the costal portion join the lymphatics of the intercostales interni, and so reach the sternal glands. b. Those of the diaphragmatic part are drained by the efferents of the diaphragm, while C, those of the mediastinal portion, terminate in the posterior mediastinal glands. The lymphatic vessels of the thymus end in the anterior mediastinal, 
tracheobronchial, and sternal glands. The lymphatic vessels of the esophagus form a plexus around that tube, and the collecting vessels from the plexus drain into the posterior medial.